We're in a brand new series, and I'm really excited about it. It's called We. And you think about how is our we? What, well, that depends on who it is. And so we're talking about our relationships, our relationship with God, our relationships with each other. And God brought three different strands into my life. And, and I love it when God weaves things together, and so it kind of brings something to your attention. And, and the first one was I got a little three-year-old buddy, and and I love to give him a big hug and pick him up, and he just wraps his arm around my neck, and he's just very affectionate. And, and yet in the conversation, I'm often talking to his mom or to my wife, and, and I'm carrying on a conversation that he's not interested in. And somewhere in that conversation, he grabs my head, and he takes it and pulls it back to himself. And if you've picked up a little kid, you've probably had that happen to you as well. And I thought, what a, what a primary illustration of what we long for, that that face-to-face, close connection. I want your attention on me, undivided attention. And the second strand of that was a song that's fairly new to me, maybe not to you, but it's called The Blessing. And it is done by Carrie Job and by uh, Cody Carnes, and it is really a statement straight from the Scriptures in a beautiful and powerful way. And it comes from these verses in Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord is speaking directly to Moses, and then Moses is speaking directly to his brother Aaron, who is the priest. It says, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you, and make his face shine on you, and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And there was this connection of that beautiful picture that it said, what is the blessing of God? It's his face toward you and shining on you and and visualizing that. And the third strand was from a devotional that I've been reading on version, called Joy, the Church, and the Neglected Face of God. I know, a long and kind of weird title. And he talks in there about the fact that we are hardwired with two sides of our brain, and the left side of our brain is the one that picks up logic and math and, and the truths about God, and the right side of our brain is what picks up that which is beautiful and artistic and relational, and, and he said a lot of our churches aim towards teaching us about the head, but not really teaching us about the relationship, and, and he dovetailed into that how even as children, when you come up to somebody and their face lights up when they see you. He said, that's joy. It's like it gives you a hint of joy when you have somebody whose face lights up to see you. And then he carries it on and says, too often our churches are joyless and our lives in the, in the spiritual life are joyless because we don't have that kind of a connection with God. And When you think of the face of God, one of the questions Pastor Ed often asks when he's trying to probe into somebody's underlying view of God, he he says, when God is looking at you and you're visualizing that, what is the expression on his face? And you know, I think a lot of people feel like the look on God's face is kind of like, what's the matter with you? Or I have to accept you, or why don't you do better? Or why didn't you do more? And And this idea that the basic fountain of joy comes when we we see that the Lord's face is shining on us. And isn't that a picture that he turns his face toward us? Now, obviously, God doesn't have a physical face. But this picture in our vocabulary that our joy is full. And you think of that scripture that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And you think, what does that mean? And we're going to look at a New Testament scripture that kind of talks about this very basic idea that relationships have to do with this deep connection. And I think for our purposes, it would be helpful to think, do we have a connection with God that is like face to face? And the the first week, as we're talking about we, we're focusing on God and me. Every week, we're going to look at we, and we're going to look at different relationships. Sometimes we're going to look at how does that impact my relationship with my spouse? How does that impact my relationship with my friends? How does that impact my relationship with my children or my neighbors? And, and at every point, it's going to be we, God plus me plus 
whatever the relationship is. And we're going to start with this foundational picture of the face of God showing, shining on us and that the joy that comes out of that connection is going to be what fuels the relationships we have in all the other sectors. In other words, this is the most foundational. This is the one out of which every other relationship grows. And so the Bible gives us a very beautiful picture in John chapter 15. If you don't already have your Bibles open or your app open or if you're taking notes on the church app, you can just quick over to John chapter 15. And, and I assume that Jesus is walking along the road with his disciples and, and I think a lot of his illustrations came from things that were right in front of them. So they may have been walking by a vineyard and he said, you know, that's a great picture because the idea of all of those luscious grapes hanging on there just makes your mouth water, and it's this picture of fruitfulness. And so he says, I want you to know how that happens. So I'm going to start by reading this passage in a translation, or it's, a ver it's not even a translation, it's a paraphrase, by a guy named J.B. Phillips, and it just puts it in very plain language. So let me read this before we dive in. Jesus says, I am the real vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He removes any of the branches which are not bearing fruit, and He prunes every branch that does bear fruit to increase its yield. Now you have already been pruned by my words. You must go on growing in me, and I will grow in you. For just as the branch cannot bear any fruit unless it shares the life of the vine, so you can produce nothing unless you go on growing in me. I am the vine itself, and you are the branches. It's the man who shares my life and whose life I share who proves fruitful. For the plain fact is that apart from me, you can do nothing at all. He goes and he says, this is the picture here, that Jesus said, I am the vine or the trunk that goes down deep into the ground. I am the source. And out of that come these secondary branches, and on the branches, the fruit grows. And he uses that as an illustration of saying, this is the critical picture for you to understand how to have a connected and close relationship with God through Jesus, and I believe it also brings a lot of those other benefits, like joy. So he says, I'm the true vine, or the real vine, and my Father is the gardener. So, the first premise there is Jesus is the vine. He is the one who is the source of everything. You cannot get what you most desperately need anywhere else. He is the vine. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He, he goes on to use that picture of he is the source of everything we most deeply need. And the, the various words that are used about that is, is that we are to abide in Him, or in the version I read, we are to grow into Him, or we are to share the life. So if we were to make this maybe a little more complete picture that says Jesus is the vine, God the Father is the one that's trimming the vines and making them more and more fruitful, and the Holy Spirit isn't directly mentioned, but He's like the, the sap or the energy that rises through the vine and goes into the branches, and ultimately, what comes out is the fruit. And I think this is critically important to us to talk about because if you don't feel loved by God, and I guess that's a deeper word than saying, oh, I know God loves me, but if it hasn't moved into the area of your experience where you feel that you are loved, then you will never be able to love like you want to. Because what happens in almost all of our lives, there's different levels of trauma and difficulty and broken relationships and pain. And I find that the, one of the things that gets damaged the most quickly is our ability to give and receive love. So many people feel unloved and it's not always because they are unloved. Sometimes it's because that mechanism to be able to absorb love is broken or damaged or is constricted. And so Jesus said, here's the way this has to start, that 
when you become a follower of Jesus, and last week, Pastor Craig walked through What does it mean that Jesus came and died and gave his life for us? And what does it mean for us by faith to say, Jesus, I put my life in your hands? And when that happens, he says, you're this branch that's placed into the vine. And yes, it means that when you die, you get to go to heaven. But that is not the only benefit. It means that as soon as you are connected to the vine, that he becomes a conduit of life to you that he is a conduit of love, that you can feel loved and therefore you can give love. He's a conduit of hope when it seems like everything is so hopeless. He is a conduit of purpose in our life when it's so difficult to find meaning. He, He is the conduit of everything we most deeply need. And he's the only source. He is the vine. Jesus is the one that brings healing. He's the one that brings patience. He's the one that brings forgiveness. He's the one that gives us humility. The things that we most deeply need, they all come from Jesus. So what's my job? If he's the source, this is the important part because quite often, whatever we say about walking with the Lord, it comes out like you just need to work harder. You need to quit doing so many bad things and start doing so many good things. And this passage actually switches that whole picture It says, you know what? You have one job. What's that one job? To continually reconnect to the vine. Now, it uses the word abide. In fact, different translations say abide or share the life or remain in or grow in. And all of those are are great word pictures. But I think what it's saying, the underlying reality, is that you and I disconnect so easily all the time. I know I do. I was thinking of a funny story I heard years ago where a guy said, we, we all struggle being distracted when we pray. And one guy said, no, I can pray for a long time and never get distracted. And so the first guy says, well, I'll give you a horse if you can pray for five minutes without thinking about anything else but your prayer. And so the guy kneels down and he starts praying and three and a half minutes into it, he, he looks up and he says, is that with the saddle or without? <laughs> And I think our minds go everywhere all the time. And so it's not that you and I get unsaved and then saved and unsaved and then saved. It's that we lose that vital connection. We lose that sense of God's face toward me and my face is towards him. That we lose that connection that fuels our life. And so what happens is all of the things come up and begin to corrode our connection. Now, if you're not very familiar with cars, you may not appreciate this, but on a car battery, there are two cables that connect to the positive and the negative, and they're tightened on there really tight, and it should all work fine. But over time, it's really easy for some oxidation to develop underneath that, and slowly, it begins to lose fire. Now, it's still looks like it's connected. So you get in there and your car goes click, 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 and you can't start it. One of the simplest problems may be that those cables have just gotten a little disconnected. Not completely removed, just a a, a buildup of this oxidation. And I think of that scripture where Jesus talks about the soils. And one of the soils is called the weedy soil, where the, the good seed goes in And then he he describes the things that grow up. And he says there are the three things. The worries about this life. The deceitfulness of of riches or of wealth. And then our other desires. And you know, I think that not only is loneliness rampant in our culture, but I think this COVID crisis has made it even worse. That the struggles that we have gone through have reduced the joy that we often (laughs) feel from somebody else. When they have a full mask on, you can't necessarily tell if they're smiling. And uh, you feel disconnected and we can't hug each other. And, And some of those things have caused us to feel more and more lonely. And then I think it's been particularly difficult when people are going through surgeries or going through life-threatening things and their loved ones can't even come into the hospital to be with them. And I think it's, it's raised even greater the threat of 
not just dying, but dying alone. And you realize that the worries of this life and the worries about everybody's opinion about everything, and I don't know about you, but everything I'm involved in seems twice as hard as it was before. And those things can pull us away from a connection with Jesus. Our, our playing with toys, and, and in fact, one of the things that, that tends to pull us away from our connection with each other is, is social media. And I don't, I don't just mean the fact that, that we're on our phones talking to other people. Sometimes those are good connections. But quite often, even in a group that's sitting in each other's presence, their face is not toward each other. Their face is on their phone. I think he says the other worries of life, that all these things come up and they begin to pull us away. And he's saying, if you're going to abide in the vine, first of all, you have to be aware when you're disconnecting. And I'll tell you, for me, one of the things is when I just get frustrated, there's been a lot of tension, there's been a lot of hard discussions, and, and I drive away or I walk away and there's like this knot in my chest, like this weight right here. And and I walk away and I feel like, ah, this is so hard. And I need to, instead of just going over what somebody said or what I should have said or what I could have said or what I shouldn't have said, I, I, I need to stop right there and just go, Lord, we need you. We need your help. We need your presence. I need you. And there's this moment where you reconnect and I, I have developed a practice, and I hope you as, have as well, to, to spend some time in the morning. And it's nice and quiet. I don't have kids at my house that are, at least I have to take care of. And I can read the scriptures, and I can pray. And it, it's kind of like you absorb this, this sense of God's presence and his peace, and you're thinking about your day in a clear way. <laughs> and that lasts just about till the time you get to the first decision at work. So abiding doesn't mean you have a quiet time with God and then you handle the rest of the day by yourself. It means that we need these constant reconnection points all through the day. Because the next part he goes on to say is the opposite of the fact that Jesus is the source. He then emphasizes the other side, which is I am a branch. Maybe we should say I am just a branch. And he goes on to describe what that means. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So he said, not only do you understand that Jesus is the source, we understand that I am a branch and I can produce nothing in my own strength, in my own life, in my own abilities. I got zero Kind of like 1 Corinthians 13 that says you can have all these great expressions of faith and of sacrifice, but if you have love, it counts for nothing. Does that mean it doesn't do any good at all? No, it means I can't do anything that is spiritually connected, spiritually, permanently good. I can't do anything. And he, and he says, I want you to accept that. I want you to embrace the fact that you can't do this, that you can't live a life full of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and the things that are the fruit of the Spirit, you can't do that without being connected into Jesus. So when you find that you are not doing those things, that those are not the attitudes of your life, the problem is not just, boy, I should do that and I'm going to beat myself because I didn't problem is, oh, I've gotten disconnected. I've gotten back in my own strength and my own energy. And he actually uses a word and he says, those that are not abiding, they wither. Isn't that a great word? They shrivel. They become joyless. They become irritated. They become without patience and without grace for others. They become unforgiving and harsh and angry. I don't know if any of those sound familiar. But the picture that says, this is what it looks like to live in a connected life with Jesus. And then, how do you do that? I think sometimes we talk in generalities, and 
And I just gave you one illustration. When you're feeling tense, when there's been a conflict, when you're, you're struggling in a relationship with somebody, sometimes it's time to stop talking and walk away and just get things sorted out with God. It may involve confessing your own angry and impulsive words. It, it may involve spending some time. And let me give you a couple of other suggestions. Sometimes you read a verse or you bring a verse to memory that you've already memorized and just pray through it. I was asking and we were talking with several people about how do you do this? And somebody said, you know, like just taking like Psalm 23 and saying, the Lord, Lord, you are the master of all. You are God. You are the only Lord is my shepherd. You're connected to me. This is personal. This isn't our shepherd. This is, Lord, you're my shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? Lord, you're here right now in the middle of this bramble bush to to help extract me and to help pull me out. So reflecting and meditating on Scripture, praying and crying out to God for help. And and then uh, several of the people on staff have been talking about this app. Uh, And I put that in your notes there on the other side. It's called the One Minute Pause by John Eldridge. And essentially, it's a pre-programmed time in the day when your phone reminds you, oh yeah, it's time to reconnect with God. And there's a a short one-minute kind of devotional thought that draws you back in and takes you through a time of kind of focused prayer. Lord, I give everything and everyone in my life back to you. And it's this time of reconnecting and re-energizing. And then I was thinking of one in my own life. (laughs) You know how you're on your way somewhere and you get there and the train comes and that little arm comes down with the blinking lights and the bells and you think, ah! What if you saw every interruption in your life as an opportunity to reconnect with God? Instead of, oh, I got to sit here now, let me pick up my phone and play with it. What if you said, okay, Lord, I need to refocus, reconnect, remember who you are, remember who I am, get back into the place where I am peaceful. So if your life feels like this, then the problem is, is we need to reconnect you to Jesus. If you've never connected to Jesus Christ, then go back and listen to last week's message about how to get connected to the vine. And then we're talking about how do you stay vitally connected. And then he brings another aspect in. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And the picture here is there are some branches that wither and they just drop off, they're cut off, they're burned, they're, they're worthless and gone. But he says, the ones that do bear some fruit, they go through the cutting process of a wise master gardener for the purpose of bearing more fruit. And he goes on and says, not only can I do nothing of myself, but God is at work to develop fruitfulness in me. Now, I personally think this COVID crisis has brought a lot of pruning Pruning is often the cutting off of things that we've come to depend on instead of Jesus. Things that maybe are legitimately idols. Maybe some things that are just distractions that that keep us really busy. In fact, in the, the material that the life groups are doing called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he talks about how we can even use God to run from God meaning that sometimes we get so busy doing for God, but we really don't have any time to spend with God. And if you're too busy doing duties, whether they are secular, job-related, family-related, or church-related, that if you're too busy to spend time with God, you're too busy. That there has to be some pruning, some cutting back, so that there's margin, that there has to be time For a Sabbath, one of the other things the book talks about is having daily times through the day when I specifically focus on my relationship with God and get back in my right mind, and then that there are times when I quit work completely and take a time of rest, that 
doing too much can be one of the things that disconnects us from the vine. And so these are the pictures that he's, he's walking us through that God is working to prune me. And what happens to a grapevine if it doesn't get pruned is it's all show and no go, which means that you have vines every which direction. You have branches that go all over. In fact, I saw one once at somebody's house that had been let go, and it was literally 40 foot up in a tree, and it was all of these different branches with leaves and very, very little fruit. And what's interesting, if you walk along and you, you see what they're doing in the vineyards after the grapes are harvested, there is a severe cutting back. And it's a very precise cutting back of what you do with the one-year wood and the two-year wood and how you shape that. And you do it for maximum effectiveness. So what, God, what is God interested in in terms of fruitfulness? Because the whole point of this is that God's plan is to make us fruitful. In fact, uh, maybe we should say that stronger, that God's goal is not to make us comfortable, but to make us fruitful. And sometimes the pruning is painful when you begin to see the selfish roots of what much of what we do is, and, and God begins to cut in and say, is that about you or about me? And as God does that, we can either fight kicking and screaming, or we can say, Lord... I want you to cut out everything in me that's hindering my relationship with you. I want to cooperate with you in this purpose of fruitfulness. And, and I want you to see how this is linked up. There, there's one of the ways that we often think of fruitfulness, and that is we think of spiritual fruit, the, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And he says the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, and the patience means long-suffering with other people, dealing with annoying people. And he talks about kindness and humility and gentleness. And, and most of those words are related to attitudes that we have that foster deep and connected relationships. Let me say that again. That the fruit of the Spirit brings attitudes in our lives that foster deep and connected relationships. But let me say it this way. I have deer in my yard all the time. I know you may also, but I have deer there for a very specific reason, because I have apple trees. And where there are apple trees dropping the fruit on the ground, there will always be deer. And where the fruit of the Spirit is at work in your life, there will always be relationships around it, because that's the result of the fruit. And so he gives us some key pointers in the next couple of verses. He says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So not only do we individually have this process of God changing our attitudes as we connect to him, but it should create these connective relationships in our marriages, in our homes, with our neighbors that should be incredibly attractive to people looking because they see love and gentleness and care and a deeper level than just politeness and civility. And Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by the fact that you have love to each other. So you think about this, it's not just me individually as a believer, but it's us together as believers in our relationships that we bring glory to God by showing the character of God in a tangible form in the way that we treat each other in the way we relate to each other. It says, showing yourself to be my disciples. And then he goes on, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, now remain in my love. So here's this conduit. Jesus said, I've been living in the Father's love, now you're living in my love, and now you're going to continue to pass that on. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. So how do you know if you're abiding or not? Well, first off, the attitudes of the Spirit will become more and more present in your life. Secondly, you will be giving glory to God by the way you relate to other people and by dealing with the difficult people in your life, you will still respond and give God glory because you are following Him. You will be listening to to what Jesus says, following his commands, and there will be joy. Now, who wouldn't want those things? 
You see, I think everybody wants fruit, but not necessarily everybody wants to go through the process to get that fruit. And God's plan, His faithfulness, is for us together. That's why this is a great foundation for our series called We, because fruitfulness isn't a solo act. Yes, I can have fruit in my own life, but really, you don't want just a single great plant. You want a vineyard. And the way that we interact with each other and the way that we treat each other is supposed to be like this face of God shining out to the world that we literally are to carry what has been given to us. And so he says that the way that you relate to me is going to be shown by how you relate to each other. And we've used this term in the past that that the horizontal, that is our relationships with each other, that it rests on the vertical, that it that it is given that we have to have this relationship with God before we can grow in our relationships with each other. And I would say it also in the reverse, that your horizontal relationships show a great deal about what your real relationship with God is like. That the fruit of how you have those attitudes and how you treat people is going to come out dependent on how deeply you are remaining connected in the vine. And so as we walk through this series, I hope that this is a challenge for you to personally recommit yourself to a morning quiet time, to daily stations through the day, either formal or informal when you're reconnecting, and to seeing and evaluating how do I relate to people based on how much God has loved me, how much He's accepted me, how much He's forgiven me, how how those things have poured into my life. And we very naturally out of this message, you're going to move to a time of communion. And I want to give you the discussion question ahead of that, and it's very simply this. What's one step that I can take to move closer to God this week? The Bible says that if you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. And we are all at different stages of our spiritual development and maybe different stages of the challenges you're facing in your life. But what's one thing you can do? And I've tried to give you several possible ideas And maybe you can find some others by talking to some of your friends about how do you stay close to Jesus? How is your heart filled? How does that an overflow in your life instead of trying to pump it up through your own effort? And one of the secrets is that it takes time. You have to stop and reflect and think. And we're grateful that you are listening this weekend, whether you're in one of our meetings or whether you're watching in your own home. And we're going to take a time just to reflect And we're going to listen to a song which is incredibly powerful called Amazing Grace. And as you listen to that, I want you to do some of the heart work in preparation. I want you to ask yourself that question, how close am I to Jesus? What Do I see his face shining towards me and and is my face turned towards him? Or have I been focused on the politics or have I been focused on the problems or have I been focused on other people? And get your face back on God. And sometimes it starts with some apologies. God, I'm sorry that I've neglected you. I'm sorry that I've walked away. I'm I'm sorry that I've let the frustration with people undermine my relationship with you. And so spend some time, the Bible calls that repenting, letting go of things. In fact, I think the most honest repentance is, God, that is ugly. You're right. Please take it out of me. I can't. And God begins to prune and to change our attitudes and change the way we see the world. And then maybe you just want to spend some time thinking about God's love for you and that He loved you so much that He knew the only way that we could be in an eternal life together was for Him to send Jesus to die. And and that's why we remember that with the, the cup of juice, just a tiny little drink, but it's to remind us of the incredible sacrifice of Jesus and His his body that was broken for us. And as you think about the amazing grace, I I want you to spend some time saying, thank you, Jesus, for your life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for so many times taking care of me. And as you spend time reflecting on the goodness of God, as He brings things to your mind, let me encourage you just to put them back in His hands. (laughs) Here's a problem you're worrying about. Put it back in Jesus' hands. Here's something you can do nothing about. Put it back in Jesus' hands. So as we sing this song together, 
I encourage you to do some of that heart work that gives you a connection with Jesus and makes you ready. And as you drink that cup and as you eat that, that bread, may it be a real shot of joy, of remembrance. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious towards you and give you peace.